Grace. Well, good evening. I was wondering, okay, I was just checking. <laughs> good morning. How's everybody, how's everybody doing? Good, good. We're excited to be here this morning. I'm excited to see you, those of you who are here this morning. Thank you for joining us and thanks for being a part of what uh, we're doing and what God has called us to do. Thank you. Those of you who are watching on Facebook Live, and also those of you who are on our church's website, we just thank you for tuning in today. Uh, we believe that we have <clears throat> a relevant message uh, for you. I think this is the last one in this series, so if you missed any of the other ones, you can go back in the church's app and get any of those and watch them as you uh, find time. But today, I think we're going to wrap that up, um, being, um, you know, the this is the fourth one, so I think that's enough. <laughs> but because uh, I don't talk about politics and religion a lot, um, hardly any, and I was moved to do this. I think it's very relevant to who we are as a ministry, who we are as a part of the body of Christ in our nation right now with all the things that are going on. It's too bad that a lot of churches just, I don't know what they do, but it just seems like as far as relevancy and what people are going through as individuals, the church just do the religious thing and, and plow forward, plow forward, but we're not that kind of church. We want to address the issues and 
talk about how, what God said about the issues that we're facing. And so that's what we'll, that's what we'll do. Uh, here's a couple of announcements. Next week, uh, next Sunday, is communion. So uh, we'll be serving communion here. If you want to be a part of that, you can come here. But also, if you are home and you, you, you can still participate with us, uh, and you just need to get your juice and your crackers, whatever you're using, get that together and be ready. It'll be near the beginning of the service so that you can have it ready when we get started. And so uh, that's about all I had for announcements for today, other than make sure you get your hard copies if you're here and you want a hard copy, uh, which is, we call these the uh, weekly challenge. And it does, we challenge you to activate the word that you hear today. And that's what this is actually doing. So a lot of what I'm teaching, it's like part of my notes. Um, here's, I'm going to let you in on a secret. When I prepare my sermon, I do this first. So I do this first because that's the meat of what I'm going to talk about. And then I prepare the sermon. And so these are really my notes. I don't put everything in there, but it's enough to get you thinking and to activate you and some things that we can do to actually be doers of the word and not just hearers only. So aren't you glad you came today? <laughs> All right, good. So uh, I want to pray and then I'm going to invite Wanda up. Wanda, we have Wanda with us again today. Wanda's going to come and sing a couple of songs. Then we will receive our offering and then we'll come back with the uh, pre-sermon video. All right. So bow your heads with me if you would, please. Father, we just thank you. Uh, you've been good to us today. and We thank you for your grace that's on our lives today. We thank you for being who you are to us. We thank you for being our heavenly father the supplier of all of our needs, the lover of our souls. And we thank you for the grace that you give us. We thank you for every person that's listening to this today, every person that's experiencing this message today, those now and those who will experience it later. May your grace abound in their hearts, in their minds, in their souls, where they can be open to hear. And even as I speak, that their inner ear, their spiritual ear is open to hear what you are saying individually to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. Say amen for one day she come. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, DTM. Good morning, all of our guests, visitors. Good to see you this morning. Good morning to our online streaming audience. Great to be in the house. If you can stand, let's stand in the presence of the Lord. We're just going to honor him with his worship this morning. And we're going to enjoy his presence and just have a good time together. Want to hear you guys singing. His songs are not hard. You'll catch them. <laughs> and you probably already know. We praise the Lord because he reigns this morning over every situation. No matter what we're going through, no matter what is going on in the world, God reigns. The Lord God omnipotent reigns. So let's sing that together and lift our voice. Yes. Let's sing to the Lord. My God reigns. My God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Lord, you reign above every name. Yes, my God reigns. My God reigns. Our God reigns. Our God reigns. Oh Lord, you reign above every name. With power and majesty, dominion, authority, you reign. Yes, you do. With power, with power and majesty, dominion, dominion and authority, you reign. Yes. Oh, 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 my God reign. My God reign. Our God reign. Our God reign. Oh, Lord, you reign above every name. Yes, my God reign. My God reign. Our God reign. Yes. Oh, Lord, you reign. Above every name With power And majesty Dominion Authority You reign over everything And everyone With power And majesty Dominion Authority You reign, yes you do We're 
you're so glad I've got rain yeah. I've got rain Oh Lord, you rain yeah. Above every name God, my God rain Yes, I've got rain Oh Lord, you rain Above every name With power and majesty Dominion you reign, aren't you glad? He reigns, yes, he does, with power and majesty, dominion. dominion. Oh, yeah, we're singing to our God, my God, reign. Our God, reign. Oh, Lord, you reign. Every name, yes, you do. My God, reign. Our God, reign. Oh Lord, you reign yeah. with power and majesty. You're Lord of Lords, you're King of Kings, and you reign. Yes, you do. We're so glad with power and dominion. You reign. Come on, one more time. Let's lift our voice to the Lord. Oh my God, reigns. Is that your reality? Our God reigns. Oh Lord, you reign over everything, everyone. Yes, you do. My God reigns. And our God reigns. Oh Lord, you reign above everything. And over my circumstances. Listen, He's given me another chance because you reign. Yes, you do, Lord. Over all my circumstances, you've given us a You reign. Yes, you do. Over every circumstance, no matter what you're going through, He'll give you a chance because He reigns. He's God of God, Lord of Lords. Over all He's given us another chance. Over the government, over the government. He reigns over my family. He reigns over my children. He reigns over our finances. Whatever we need, he reigns. He reigns, yes, he does. He reigns, yes, he does. He reigns, yeah. Lord, we're glad you reign over us. He reigns, listen. He reigns. Hallelujah. Bless his name. Glory to a reigning, powerful, majestic God who loves us. In Revelation 19, it says, the Lord God omnipotent reigns. And that same God in Genesis at the beginning said he took man and he formed him and he breathed life. He breathed into our nostrils and he breathed life into us. And I'm so glad about that. Our response to him because in him we live and move and have our very being, it tells us in the book of Acts too. Our response is praise. So let everything that has breath praise the Lord. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour Are you, Lord? You give life. 
Remember, he is your God. He reigneth. He sits in every situation. Give your praise to him. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you Wanda, thank you. Sound like we were going to do our God reign again. <laughs> were you ready? I was ready. <laughs> oh, but we want you to uh, prepare for an offering if you're choosing to give today. Give you an opportunity to do that. Most of our people do that online and even before we ever get here, but we want to give you an opportunity if you're here today to be a part and uh, communicate with us through finances. I want to pray and bring your attention, first of all, when we talk about giving and saving and living, that's our model when we talk about giving. A lot of times when you go to church, we only talk about giving, but um, our finances. God gives us and blesses us with jobs and opportunities uh, for income, but we are to do several things with that, not just give, not just live, but also to save. Um, probably because of the way most of us, I shouldn't say most of us, the way I grew up, we needed every penny we got. 
That's the way we grew up. And we didn't have none left. And when we talk about giving, we still gave a tenth of everything that came in. My wife and I, we were sitting out on the deck yesterday, that evening, and just talking about where we've come from. And um, she grew up in the city, but they still had, like, outside toilets. And uh, there were some things I didn't quite understand about how all that worked. But I told her about, I remember, and I couldn't have been any more than, um, I was probably about six years old, but I can remember, because we didn't, we didn't have a house with a furnace, you know, blowing air in every room. Um, the heat, when we woke up, everybody came to the same room. That's where the heat was. Um, and then I remember one morning going into the kitchen to get a drink of water. And then the drink of water, there's no sink, there's no running water. And so, <laughs> so one thing funny my wife said, so y'all didn't have running water? I said, we had running water, but it was me. I ran and got the water. <laughs> so <laughs> that was the running water. I had to run out to the pump with a bucket, come back with the water. And so we had a drinking bucket with a dipper that we, you know, you had to have your glass or your cup, and you, you, you dipped. If you got caught drinking out of the dipper, you got a whipping. That was a no-no. I've gotten a spanking for that before, because it's just quicker to just, you know. Anyway, but one morning, uh, and in Mississippi, it didn't get that cold all the time, but it got cold enough. One morning, I went to get some water out of the bucket in the kitchen, and the dipper was frozen in the bucket. That's how cold it is in the rest of the house where there is no heat. And so we've learned to appreciate. I've come a long way. I've learned to appreciate how God has blessed me, how God has increased me. And that's what uh, Thomasine and I was talking about yesterday. She sends her love to you today. But we were just talking about how far we've come, how God has blessed us. And so I'm sure some of you have some of the same kind of stories based on where you came from. God has blessed you. And so when we talk about giving, it's not just giving, but it's also saving some for later and also living on the rest. And then by God, get out of debt. You know, by all means, get out of debt. And so we are grateful today. I am excited about what God is doing, and I'm excited about what he's doing uh, here at Grace Transformational Ministries and what we have planned for you, um, those of you who are connecting with us. Uh, I'm excited about that, and we'll be telling you more about that later. But if you are giving today and uh, you need an offer, an envelope, or anything, just wave your hand, and the guest spots, our service volunteers will make sure you get what you need. Uh, but if you're making out a check, you can make your checks payable to GTM uh, or Grace Transformational Ministries, either one will work. And if you need to mail that, you can mail it to our P.O. Box 320725. And that's Flint, Michigan, 48532. So God bless you. There are other ways to give. You can give right in the app. Um, you can go to the website and give. But we want to just thank you. And I want to pray for those of you who are giving. If you are ready to give, our volunteers are ready to just receive our offering here. But I want to pray for you who are giving or have given and who do uh, continuously give. God, we thank you for those whose hearts have been touched and who trust us to do what you put us in the earth to do with the finances. And so as we um, even collect and remember this during this time, how you blessed us uh, financially and how you have watched over us. We give thanks to you, and I pray that you would bless those who give, those who support the work that you've given us to do and trust us to do that. I pray that you would increase them financially, that you would cause increase to come. Money that's been held up in Jesus' name, we declare that it's being released right now in Jesus' name. And we just thank you for promotions on jobs, increase in business, we magnify you and thank you that as you bless us, 
Our desire is to be a blessing in the earth to the things that you care about. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you again, and God bless you. Uh, if you will, turn your attention to the screen for the pre-sermon video. Freedom. Again, this series, True Freedom and Keeping It Real, bringing all of that into focus at the same time. I believe that um, it's a message that is very relevant for where we are today and what we're experiencing, uh, where our, some of, it seems like some of our freedoms made that we've had and experienced finally uh, could be threatened. But um, when it comes to freedom, and when it comes to where we look to get freedom from, if you notice in the video, one of the things it said is that freedom is a gift. And it's a gift that was given not by people, but by God. God created us in his image, and we are created to be free. And as you can see, part four here, um, we're talking about politics, religion, and reality. Uh, that's, that's something I don't even like to say at church sometimes, but... Politics, religion, and re reality, that's why we call it keeping it real. Today, the, the title is A City on a Hill. We've talked about several titles before. Last week, we're talking about leading the way forward, and then we're talking about the church, the role of the church in our freedom, the role of the church in our nation right now. What's, what's, what, what's God called us to do? And this is really a continuation of that. But uh, we titled today a, a City on a Hill uh, um, be, for several reasons. One of the things that when we think about that title, when I think about that title, of course, I grew up in church, and so I know there's a scripture uh, that talks about when Jesus was um, talking to his disciples. Actually, he was talking to his disciples, but it was his Sermon on the Mount. How many of you are familiar with the Sermon on the Mount? Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And... Um, and he started this message off and uh, talking about blessed with the Beatitudes. Remember, blessed are all the different people. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness and a whole bunch of other ones. But really, he was laying out what the kingdom looks like and kingdom, how kingdom people respond. And right after he did that, he got into the word. We're going to get into the word of what he did uh, with that later. But last week, we talked about you know, political, meaning, you know, how people who rule, where that rule comes from. And for us who are Jesus followers, uh, some people just, we just call them Christians, but so many people use the word Christian today. But if you are a true Jesus follower, Jesus 
is your king. Jesus is our king. Jesus, and that's why we call him King Jesus. It's spiritually, mentally, physically, Jesus rules. Jesus is Lord. And that's how we choose to express our allegiance, first of all, is to Jesus. We are Jesus followers. And so I have a question to get this message started off for you today. And that's this. Do you believe that God has always had a unique purpose for America on the world stage? When we think about America, do you believe that God has always had a purpose specifically for America when it comes to the whole world? And uh, if you're online, I'm, I'm looking. If you're here, uh, you, can, you can chat back. But, you know, many people believe that some of them are um, interesting. Some people believe, that we, I mean, we know that Jesus, how can I start this off? Um, in the Middle East, we know how important Jerusalem is because people expect Jesus to come back on the mountain. And then they, that's why there's a whole fight between uh, Israel and um, the other individuals, the, the Islam and the other ones in that same region because of how important Jerusalem is. And some people feel like that's why America politically supports Israel, and some of, some of it may be part of that reason. Um, I mean, I've heard ministers and pastors and leaders, spiritual leaders say, you know, if you're going to be on God's side, you got to make sure that you are supporting Israel. And, um, and we say that like we don't care what Israel does, we need to support them. But Israel need to do what Jesus said to do. And when we all do what Jesus said to do, then we can play that card. But if Israel's doing what the devil is doing, then anyway. So some people think when you, when you I was going to, I meant to put this on the slide for you so you can see. When you look at the word Jerusalem, right in the middle of Jerusalem is USA. And some people feel like, that's why we need to support Jerusalem. God has already put our name in the middle. Anyway, um, that's just a coincidence in how you spell Jerusalem. It's got USA in the middle. <laughs> but, but I believe there could be other reasons why God has purpose for us as Americans. But I wanted to talk about um, you know, where a lot of this came from when we look at, especially politically, um, we had a president, President Ronald Reagan. Uh, he had a line that he took from John Winthrop's sermon that, where John Winthrop says that we are a city on a hill. That's why, that's why I titled today's subject, City on a Hill. And President Ronald Reagan used that same slogan. John Winthrop was, he was the first mayor of Massachusetts and governor of Massachusetts. And he was also a very religious man. And so... When they came and they started, you know, um, populating the land, they were actually considered Puritans, if you read about the Puritans when you were in school. <laughs> Anyways, um, he, he did a sermon as he was preparing for that, and part of his sermon actually talked about, he, he believed that what they were beginning was something that God had planned. That's why he used a city that sits on a hill. And we're going to talk about where that came from. But um, when we shall be a city on a hill, that's, that's what he actually talked about um, that in that sermon. We shall be, that was his actual quote, we shall be as a city upon a hill. And so I want to do a couple of things here as we get into this message um, when I look at America, and I also look at one significant thing that even other nations look to us, uh, look at us in a way. Um, I'm going to put an image up here. I'm sure you recognize what that is, right? That's Lady Liberty, right? And um, so what does this symbol mean to you? Individually, why don't you think about it a couple of different ways? Individually, even as a nation, um, even as a Christian or Jesus follower, what does this symbol mean to you? 
Mm, I know. It's confusing. You're at church. You're not supposed to talk at church. I used to get whippings for speaking at church. But you can <laughs> chat if you want to, back and forth. And those of you who are online can, can chat. <laughs> but yeah, you get in trouble. You still get in trouble. I'll come down there. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, but um, when we look at Lady Liberty, there's a whole lot of things that, um, you know, come. The, that, that statue was gifted to America from France, and um, there, were, um, there were meanings when they gifted it to us. For example, I'm going to bring up a couple of those things. But I want to show you something I'm wondering if you've ever noticed. Do you know where that picture comes from? That's, that's a close-up of Lady Liberty's feet. And there's chains down there which symbolizes freedom. The chains are broken. So Liberty... But there's, there's, uh, there's some things, I mean, I, I, this, was, this is what happens when you start studying. <laughs> it's like, what? But the artists who did this, and um, there were two that were included, and I can remember one of them, because one, the artist that created the frame, the iron frame, his last name is Eiffel, because it's the same man that, that designed the Eiffel Tower. In France, but the the I I think I have a, I think I have his name. But I, a couple other questions here before we you know. Well, let me ask you this question: How many facts can you name about the Statue of Liberty? Hmm. But we're free, <laughs> right? Okay. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna learn a few of them today. Couple. That's, that's the torch, right? That's in her right hand. And I say her right hand. Why is it a woman? <laughs> well, she got a dress on. Somebody said she got a dress on. It's a woman. Right, but, but why even put a dress on a person and call it a woman as representing liberty? Um, it actually comes from the Greek god Liberus. Libertus. And, and so and that's the background for it. But the torch is actually a symbol that we are the enlightened, we enlighten others about freedom in the world. But they, that's, that's the meaning of wh where that comes from. And then, how many of you recognize this? So the torch is in her right hand. This is what she's holding in her left hand which is a tablet that has to do with the rule of law. But on that tablet, they have in July 4th, 1776, the year that America was supposedly free. But that's, that's what that statue is. Um, oh, I did have the names here for you. The, the, they're the two names who actually designed that. The sculpture was Bertholdi, and then Eiffel was the person that actually designed the frame um, for that. Um, and they gifted that to America because of our love for freedom. And that represents free. Everybody wants to be free. The spikes, somebody, is that what somebody, somebody was asking why? The, the, said there are seven of them it's the, uh, to represent the different oceans. Um, and America, that's, that's why some people think we're unique. We are unique, but we're kind of in the middle of all these, you know, oceans and continents, and God has used us. And he has, whether that was his original purpose or not, um, but um, that's, that's where we are. But where John Winthrop got this idea was from Scripture. So let's look at the Scripture here. Um, where he, this came from. He says, you are the, this is Jesus talking uh, as he's talked about the blessings on the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus said, after he talked about all the different blessings, he said, you are the salt of the earth. 
But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under feet. Salt, I don't know about you, but since, you know, when, when um, I talked to you a little bit about when I was growing up, as, <laughs> but I can remember at my, at my grandpa's house, they didn't have a refrigerator. And they had a box near the back door in the kitchen where they kept all the meat and it was salted down. So I started studying. I was like, so anyway, salt is a preserver and it has chemicals in it that preserves things. And that, that's how we kept the meat, you know? When you got, <laughs> when you got ready for some bacon, you just... You just went in the box and cut off a slab and then start slicing it. You know, you might have to soak it for a little while so it's not too salty. But it was preserved. That's, I mean, because I would be there when they kill a hog or when they kill a cow, you know, and, but that's, that's how we live. But here, what Jesus said is, you are the salt of the earth. So you are the preservation. You are the preserver. What this brings me to a, um, a scripture in Genesis. Remember when Sodom, when, when Lot went to Sodom and the Sodom and Gomorrah was such a wicked city that God was going to destroy the entire city. And that's what he actually ended up doing. But he first said he was going to go and talk to Abraham. And do you remember Abraham tried to negotiate with God and said, Abraham said first, he said, God, are you going to wipe out all the righteous with the wicked? So Abraham said, what if there are just 50 righteous people in the city? Would you, would you destroy this, the whole city? And God responded. He said, if there are 50 righteous people in the city, I'll spare the whole city. Not just the 50 righteous, but the whole city. See how important righteous people are? Then Abraham said, he must have got to thinking. He's like, mm, it might be hard to find 50. But how about 45? And God said, even if there are 45 people in the city, I'll spare the whole city. Then Abraham is probably thinking about all of them. Okay, he's like, okay. Uh, how, uh, what if we just found 40? Because he, he must have been thinking of 10 people in his mind that he just think wasn't going to do right, no way. And God said, if there are 40 people in the city that are righteous, I'll spare the entire whole city. And then Abraham said, excuse me, God, but I don't mean to like, just bug you, but what if there are 30? And God responded. Then he said, what if there are 20? And God said, if there are 20, just 20 righteous people in the city, I'll spare the whole city. And Abraham, he must have got to thinking about his family and said, thinking that, okay, we might be the only ones. So what if there are just 10? If there are 10 righteous people in the whole city, would you still wipe out the city? God said, if there are 10 righteous, you can count them on your fingers, right? If there are 10 righteous people in the city, I will spare the whole city. That's how important being salt is. That's how important it is for us to be salt. And this, when we look at this scripture, and obviously they didn't find 10, barely found one, and God destroyed the whole city. But Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. So when he says here, when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, we have to be the salt wherever we are. We have to be the pres that, that chemical that preserves. We are the chemical in the earth that actually holds back some of the judgment from God. Some people say, well, America is under judgment. You know, um, some people believe that, and it could be, but... When there are righteous people involved and included, God will spare the city because of the righteous. And so God is saying here, but if you lose your saltiness, if you lose it, then 
what, you know, how can you get it salty again? If, you, if the chemical's gone, if you're no longer, in other words, if you're the salt of the earth and you're no longer um, doing, really being a follower of Jesus, doing what Jesus said to do, and some of us, we've been lured out of that. Some of us, what's become more important than what Jesus said is what our political party said. What's, what our political party believes, and we just come in. I mean, and, and trust me, I want you to vote however you want to vote. I, I believe we should be a church where people vote both different ways. This is not a Democratic church. This is not a Republican church. This is where you vote based on your own convictions, and you do that. And, there, and if anybody say anything to you, you, t- you tell them, come see me. <laughs> anyway, like I'm going to do something. Anyway, but um, you vote the way you want to vote. But what I say comes first is what Jesus says and us following Jesus. And so the parts of either party, there are parts of both parties that don't do what Jesus said do. And so there's some parts of both parties that do, do what Jesus said do. So, uh, you know, it's crazy for you to be in one party and look at everybody else like they're the devil. And you in the other party, if you're a Republican, you look at the Democrats like, how could you even do that, you know? And then people that are Democrats look at the Republicans and say, how could you even do that? And so every person has their own perspectives. But the big perspective is if you are a Jesus follower, no matter which party you are part of, you need to be salt in the earth. And, and so Jesus went on to say, you know, um, you are the salt of the earth, but if that loses its saltiness, it's not worth anything except for to be trampled under the feet. In other words, once a salt that lost all of its chemical reaction, they used it for putting in paths for people to walk on. <laughs> and he's saying, when you are no longer salty, when you are no longer being obedient, because what we're supposed to do as salt is in... in actually inspire people or evoke people to really want to be like us because we're trying to be like Jesus. And so it's a draw. We're drawing people to be like Jesus, to be Jesus followers. And if we've lost our saltiness, that doesn't happen. The next verse actually says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. So you're not just salt, but you are salt and light. And so the light, you are the light of the world. And that's one of the reasons for the, you know, this, my interpretation as far as the uh, torch in uh, Lady Liberty's right hand. I mean, as far as enlightenment, we are the light because Jesus is the light. And we're not a self-illuminating light. We are reflective light of the true light, which is Jesus. Scripture says that Jesus, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And so we reflect him as we obey him. We reflect him as we reflect the love that he gives to you, and you can reflect that love to others. And and where it matters is when you reflect that kind of love that comes from him to people who don't deserve that kind of love. It's some of those people who don't deserve it who would, based on their action, it makes you not want to extend it. <laughs> and that's what makes you different is when you see someone who is pro- provoking you <laughs> to not love them and that to the point of where you don't want nothing to do with them or you want to hate them. You want to either, you know, you can say, I don't want nothing to do with them. That's one level. And then you go all the way other ways and not just, no, I want to do something to them. That's, but when... <laughs> God wants us to evoke that kind of love in others and to others as we share that. So you are the light of the world. We should be sharing the the love of God, the grace of God, and the truth of God. That's what people need. Those things are, are so important and so missing in the lives of individuals who, you know, not just because of political things, but everything. It's just it's just missing. So in the, when we do what Jesus said to do, then we should be a light in our city. And, and not, just, not just our church, not just 
you know, Grace Transformational Ministries, but what all of the Jesus followers should be a light in your, our city. There's so many things happening in our city. I had a quick conversation, Pastor Thomasine and I had a quick conversation with the superintendent of schools in this area, and he was just talking about all of the teenagers who are killing each other and all of the things that's and so we said we were going to set up a, a time to get together. And we need to do some things. We need to be active. We need to be the salt in our region, in our neighborhoods. We need to be the light in our neighborhood. Jesus followers, we can make a difference in our city if we share the love, the real love of God, and share the real grace of God, giving people some space for them to change. That's really what grace does, give people inspires them to change and give them some space to change. Most of us, if you came and you said that you changed and then we look at you and you did something that showed that you haven't changed yet, then we say, I, see, I knew it wasn't nothing to you. You weren't, you weren't going to change. And that's not how God sees it. God sees it as a process, you know, progressively changing. You're, he's, he's, he's ministering to your spirit I can't minister to your spirit. I'm, I'm, I can say some things. I can make you feel a certain way emotionally. But it's God who does the work in your spirit that changes you. And then you have to do the work from your spirit to your soul that changes your responses and your behavior. So that takes some time. I know there's some people who stop doing things. You know, when I was growing up, we thought some of the worst things you could do was smoke and drink. And so when somebody came to church and got saved and stopped smoking immediately, we were like, ooh, God moved. And, or just stopped drinking immediately. But everybody, don't do that. And we still have to work with them. And it's, it's not like they're going to hell because they smoke some cigarettes. You know, it's like something Pastor Stokes told one of, one of the members. You know, he was like, he was kind of like, I, he was being real. He was like, I smoke. He said, now, am I, you know, am I going to hell because I'm smoking? And Pastor Stokes said, well, you, you might not go to hell because you're smoking, but you might go to heaven a lot quicker than some of the rest of us. And so it's, it's what it's doing to your body, you know, physically. It's not like some, it, we, need to, we need to take care of what God has given us. So we can make a difference in our city. We can make a difference in our state to, as we grow and do, become doers of the word of God. When we take the challenge and go and work on it during the week on ourselves individually, it makes a difference in our neighborhood. It makes a difference in our city. It makes a difference in our state. Um, I, I'm actively trying to do some things in my neighborhood. My neighborhood, most of the houses are a long ways apart because I live out in the country. And um, when Thomasine and I came back from um, the last vacation, we were on July 4th, we came back the next day, and we found out one of our neighbors had been killed doing fireworks. And, and I didn't know, this is how bad I felt because... Uh, FedEx had left somebody's package on my porch, and it wasn't mine, and I looked at the address, and I decided to take it to the house where it goes to, which I had never been to before. And I took it, and somebody came to the door and said, yes, it's ours, and I left. And when I came back, Fox News was coming to my house. I'm like, I'm just coming. What? Why is Fox News here? And Fox News is the one who told me, well, someone, there was a tragedy here last night, and we're following up on the story. So then Thomasine and I was like, well, we need to figure out what's going on. And we didn't know who it was. Come to find out, I found out three days later, the person who was killed was the house that I took the package to. And I didn't even know that they were even dealing with that. And so it moved something on the inside of me. There's some things that we need to do in our own neighborhoods uh, to share and show the love of God in our state, in our city, and even till it makes a different in, difference in our nation. It's important for, uh, for Jesus followers 
to be the salt and to be the light. So as, as we said last week, the role of the church and is to be the conscience of the nation. We, we can't, you can't legislate love. You can't put a rule in place and enforce it and say, you're going to love your neighbor. <laughs> Only Jesus can command us to love, and he did. But it's because we first accept him. But somebody, uh, let something written that's going to make you do something, it's not going to happen. And the rest of that scripture says, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on the stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In other words, if you are the light of the world, don't hide it. Don't, don't, if you are the light of the world, don't stay home and close your garage and never talk to your neighbors. That's like, you know, putting a bowl over the light. It's like, I came home from work, closed the garage, shut the doors, pulled the curtains. I don't want nothing to do with nobody. I'm fine. That may be the way you used to live, but in the same way, let your light shine. Say that. Let your light shine. That's the, that's the one job we have to do is let your light shine that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. If we can, if we can just shine with love, shine with grace, shine with truth, if we can just shine, then he says those, in those good deeds will glorify your Father in heaven. That's, and look at what it says, though, that they may see. Who's the they? That's everybody else that's looking in and looking on, seeing your uniqueness, seeing your difference. So we're not so different just because we are Americans. We're different because we are Jesus followers. So here's what Paul I like the way Paul talks about this. He starts off in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, um, and he starts off in, in some verses earlier, um, still talking about how Christ has made the difference in our lives and God, we've been reconciled. Um, God reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. That's what God, that's the work that God did. And so he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Now, I grew up with the King James Version, so I put that in here for you too. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are come, become new. And so if you are in Christ and you've accepted Jesus Christ, you're a brand new person. You are spiritually transformed. Now, we still have to do some transformation as far as your soul, as far as your behavior. That still comes. But you are a new creature starting from your spirit. You are a brand new creature and old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. Now, when we look at that, he says in the, in the very next verse, he says, all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, once God has reconciled us, he's now given us the responsibility and given us the ministry of reconciliation. We do the work of reconciling. We become examples so that others can be reconciled to God. When we look at who has reconciled us, we've been reconciled. In other words, God does not look at your wrong and count that against you anymore. That's good news, right? God doesn't, God doesn't look at your sin and count that against you anymore. He look at who you are through Jesus Christ, a brand new creature, and count you as righteous instead of all of the things that you did before. He's reconciled. He's, he's made up the difference. You don't owe anything. You are free. That's what real freedom really is. See, part of the freedom is spiritual freedom, too. When we look at being free, the enemy has influenced us so much that the things that you even desire to do that's wrong, it's an influence because of what you... 
even if you do it one or two times, then you end up, you realize that you become bound to it. You, it's, now you're in bondage. You're stuck until you can break free. But what Jesus is saying here, and what Paul is saying here, you've been reconciled to God. You are free. You are, first of all, you're born, you're being transformed in your spirit. Now you are free to actually be transformed in your soul, in your body, in behavior. And now you are a minister. Immediately you are a minister of reconciliation because of who you are uh, to him. And, that, and he goes on to say that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Um, and in one scripture says the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, God's not counting people's sins against them anymore. That's the message that we need to give to people. God is not counting your sins against you anymore. He has a message of reconciliation for you, and that's what I'm here to share. Think about what, what the way I grew up in church. Most of, especially in my younger years, most of what we said to people, first of all, we waited for them to come to church on however they happened to come. And then if they came, you know, say, for example, somebody came in with a mini skirt on, then the first thing was church mama was, you know, before the, before the child can even um, hear what the preacher had to say, the church mama then came over with one of them big church lap scars. Is that what they got? <laughs> a blanket or something. Boom. You know, and then begin to talk to them. You know, honey, you can't wear that in here. You know, um, but... That's not the first message. That can't be the first message. Love and grace and truth, they all have to come, but the first message can't be, oh, you can't. I remember there, <laughs> I remember there, was, a, there was a person who played guitar. He, he was not saved, and he wanted to play at one of the services. This was down south. Me and my granddaddy, I was, I was my granddaddy's road dog. He had 21 churches that we went around and did revivals at and stuff. And so we were at this one church, and we were having a good time. We were jamming, and this one, one guy wanted to play. And, uh, you know, granddaddy told him, so, you know, you, know, you, you got to get saved first, you know. And um, I'm going to leave that right there. I want you to think about that. Because today, I don't even know if that person ever came back to church again. So we've got to show love, inclusiveness. We've got to open the door and show that grace to people that Jesus also shared. Think about what Jesus did. He invited Judas to be a disciple, knowing that he was going to betray him. And Matthew, at this, the King James Version said he was at the seat of customs. Matthew was doing his job cheating Jews out of their money, taking it in, and Jesus went to him and said, follow me. His disciples, the other ones, Peter, James, John, they weren't too excited about that, but they learned and they ended up I don't know how long it took them to accept Matthew, but anyway, we have to learn and we have to, um, what's a good word? Everybody's not going to be just like you. And we have to learn to be tolerant of other individuals who don't, who are not just like you in order to expose them to the real love of Christ. And so um, Paul goes on to say, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. You know what an ambassador is? It's a, first of all, an ambassador is a diplomat. It's, he's or she is a person that represents another country. And they're in the country that they're in. So Christ, Paul is saying, you are Christ's ambassador. Your citizenship is really not on this earth. It's in heaven. You are a member of the body of Christ. You are a member of God's family. And so you are an ambassador. You are here to show others 
what the love of God is like. You are here to show others what the grace of God is like. You are here to show others what the truth of God is like. So he says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. God is making his appeal to individuals who don't care about him, don't like him, don't want nothing to do with him. He's making his appeal to those individuals through you and through me as ambassadors. We can't come into an area representing heaven and we are just as destructive as the people who are in the area doing the the destruction. We got to... We got to come in as a diplomat. Diplomacy, using diplomacy means war is not the first thing. <laughs> you know, like, oh, we, okay, we just kill all them who ain't doing right. And then we'll have, you know, we, the rest of us who want to do right. And it's, some of us Christians have that kind of, you know, this, it's crazy. Just, if you ain't going to do right, we'll just kill you. See, it don't sound right when I say it, right? But think about what some of us, you know, but look at this. As ambassadors for Christ, we aim to reflect what? His love, his grace, and his truth, helping to draw others to the Christian faith through our words and through our actions. So our words have to be different. They have to be seasoned with grace. Our words and our actions, our behavior has to be seasoned with something that entices people to want to be like Jesus Christ. So here's your challenge today. All right. Your challenge is to let your light shine. Let your light shine. It's not like you turn it on and turn it off. It's you're covering it up with other things. And so we have to make sure that we're not, we don't have the shades down. We, we let the light out. The light that you have is not self-generated, but a reflection of Jesus's love, grace, and his truth. And ambassador as an ambassador, represent. That's, that's our challenge, is represent. So here's three ways we can implement this today, this week. Number one, represent the values and the policies of your home country, which is heaven. That's where God is, and that's where we all looking to go one day, but that's your home country. Represent the policies and the values there, which is love, grace and truth. Think about that. I mean, there are a whole bunch of laws we could come up with, but if you can represent love, if you can represent grace, if you can represent truth, then you can be a person who's actually influencing and evoking others to, and drawing others to become like Jesus himself, being a follower. Number two, as an ambassador, you are a diplomat. So engage in activities that foster good relationships, not turn people away. <laughs> you know, don't be a person who people hate to see you coming because you're always pointing out what they did wrong. That's not how you get people to want to do right. Okay. It's quiet in this place. <laughs> Engage in activities that foster good relationships with all people and resolve conflicts. Be a person that you resolve conflicts. You're a peacemaker. It's one of the things that Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. You are the ones who are the ones who are even other people who have conflicts. When you come, you can create and make, calm things down and make peace. And the third one is this week, as an ambassador for Christ, purposefully represent Jesus Christ and his teachings to others in your everyday activities, in your every, whatever you do, we all do different things. Whatever it is that you do, represent in the middle of what you do. Represent love, represent grace, represent truth in what you do as an activity and see how that changes individuals at work. I, I, this is the first time in the last couple of years where people at work <laughs> starting to call me pastor. And I don't, I don't necessarily like that because some people, I, I, and I know you're looking at me like, well, why not? 
Well, um, one reason is when people find out that you're religious at all, they avoid you. And I want, you know, I want people to feel free when they're around me. I don't care if they're cussing, whatever they're doing. I want the opportunity to let my light shine. But if I'm telling them, oh, stop all that cussing. I'm, 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 a, I'm a pastor. Don't be cussing in front of me. Then my, I just covered up my light. I just put it out. You know, I never want to have nothing to do with you again. But there, there's this one lady, <laughs> this one lady at, at where I work. She doesn't even call me by, by my name. She just calls me pastor. Just pastor. And she don't care who hears it. Well, we talking in a business meeting. But pastor said someone. <laughs> I'm like, okay, 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 okay. But this week, be an ambassador. Whatever it takes for you to be an ambassador. Be an ambassador of Jesus' teaching. Be an, an ambassador of his love, of his grace, and of the truth. And so um, we, I want us to take this with us today, uh, whether you have it on your phone, in our app, or if you want to pick up a hard copy Take this with you today, and I want to pray for you before you leave, and I want to give, uh, uh, give you an opportunity. Those of you who are online and everyone, even if you're here, I'll give you an opportunity. If you want to know more about this and, you, and if, you're, if you need some help doing this, you can scan this QR code. Uh, the same QR code is on the hard copy if you take one with you, and it'll bring you to a connection form where you can tell us you were here or you heard the message. And whatever it is, if you need prayer, you can respond in all those different things and you can respond as to how you would like for us to respond to you. And we will respond to you. There are individuals who reach out for prayer, individuals who um, say, well, I need some help with, you know, um, number one, representing the values of policies of my home country, you know, I'm not too good, because some people are just not. I mean, I grew up in a loving family. Everybody didn't. They're comfortable when there's chaos. It, that's true. It's, and if ain't nobody fighting, they, don't, they feel like something's wrong. And so they start fighting, start something, say something that starts to fight so it can be normal around here. So if you, anyway, if you need help with any of those things, I want to pray with you now, and you can reach out and let us know, and we'll reach out to you um, to make sure that you get what you need. You can say, um, I am ready to be a Jesus follower. I am ready to make that decision today, if that's you. You can let us know before you leave today if you're here, but you can also make, let us know by scanning the QR code, and we will get with you and make sure that you take the proper steps so that you can be who God created you to be. So bow your heads, if you will, please. Father, we thank you today for your grace, and for your light that you shine on us and in us, that we might be salt and light to the world. Our desire, God, is to be the chemical in the room that it, as we expose that chemical, it preserves the whole room. It preserves the whole city. It holds back judgment because there are some righteous people in the room. We look to you, God, to help us to be that salt, help us to be that light that we may illuminate and be the city that sits on a hill and let our light shine. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Hi, guys. Welcome to Abbey Road. Please come in. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Watching. 